This is Impact Healthcare, people and strategies that are disrupting the health benefits industry. And now, here's your host, healthcare benefits industry expert and the originator of the transparent health benefits movement, Lester Morales. Man, I normally don't have to introduce people, but I really probably don't have to introduce this person. Dave Chase, welcome to Impact Healthcare, the podcast that is interviewing people like you that are the people and the strategies that are impacting health benefits for maybe the four people who have been living under a rock these last decade that might not know who you are. Give us an introduction to Dave Chase, who you are and where your passion comes from. Yeah, I I co-founded an organization called Health Rosetta. Um, and the reason I did that and what put me on this quest, really kind of my journey, my why, was uh, unfortunately by the time I was in my late 30s, I'd had 10 friends my age or younger die. And obviously they're all a gut punch and they cause you to reflect a lot. But the last one really was that. And you know, the short version of that story is one that sadly isn't a unique story and that my friend, uh, she got a cancer diagnosis, you know, one out of four, one out of five times, it's going to be wrong. And so it's not because we have bad people or bad doctors, but we have bad systems. And naturally that led to uh, the wrong treatment plan, ultimately, um, you know, ruining her not only physically, uh, but also emotionally and financially leaving behind a 10-year-old daughter as a single mom. That was brutal to see that. Um, and I had actually been out of healthcare for over a decade at that point. Earlier in my career, uh, I put in health IT systems, you know, some of the, those giant systems that we bemoan like many moons ago. I was involved in that and then started Microsoft's healthcare platform business, which a lot of people don't know. That's a $30 billion ecosystem today, about 28,000 partners globally. And as I reflect on that, I'm one who tries to find some positive out of the you know really negative situation. Um, I realized that it was a system problem and that uh, you know the way I was raised, if you see a wrong, you don't do something about it. You're complicit. And I've realized not that, of course, any of us had malice, but um, like I was part of that system, right? And I need, I knew something about it. And, but I was really on the health IT side, really not where I've ended up. And, you know, anytime you have tragedies, right, you ask why a lot, but certainly there's this truism you want to understand problems you ask why five times. I did that ultimately. Fast forward, health plans are what dictates basically everything in healthcare. And when we talk about some of the very unfortunate things, including that we, you know, waste more money in the US healthcare system than the entire size of the Russian economy, it's not an accident. Um, and, you know, I wrote a book on the opioid crisis. Again, it's not an accident when you have perverse incentives even when you have good people inside of systems that are sort of tragically flawed because of perverse incentives. So when I learned that, I learned that you, you know, to be very blunt and provocative, there's no saving the current system other than the clinicians. You all, you have to do a reset. That's always true, right? You know, just to be flippant, right? We didn't get you know, iPhone by putting icon stickers on rotary phones, right? You always have to do that. And and so that put me on this journey to understand, okay, that's a really, it's both this kind of ridiculous and obvious statement at the same time that you have to develop a new industry supply chain. But like, when, when does that happen? How do you do that? Right. Um, and so that's led me, and of course, there's a lot more to the story, but that led me to do this. And we realized the tip of the spear, you know, be, you know, a year before I founded Health Rosetta, I wrote a piece for Forbes. This job could save America. And was talking about what I think is the most underestimated role in the entire U.S. economy, the benefits broker, the benefits advisor role. And so that is why that became the tip of the spear 
on our movement and and really you know i didn't know hell's plans um i joke on my linkedin profile i'm an archaeologist because i just went digging like people were problem solvers the world over you know necessity is a mother invention somebody had to have solved this problem so i just went digging and i found amazing employers amazing benefits advisors maybe doing things against their own economic interest but doing the right thing and really the only um puzzle was you know on the one hand you have this kind of dystopian reality that most are living in in our system and on the other hand we have almost a utopia compared to that i was like gosh that's just a marketing problem like everybody would want that how do you do that and so that's what put me on this quest um to sort of rebuild how health plans build and you know the the way i look at it is our job is to make it much easier to build world class community owned health health plans that cost half as much and it actually can be done and so our job is to make that easier there's already people who've done that many people have heard about the rosen and hotels story by now and if they haven't you know they should and that was a focus of my TED talk um, about a year before I launched Health Rosetta. Um, you know, they came with to be saved over half a billion dollars, but others hadn't copied it. And that's my background of taking very nascent things and turning it into something that can be replicated hundreds and then thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of times. That's part of where I had a unique skill set along with my co founders to, you know, go on this crazy quest. Um, and so, you know, fast forward, you know, we launched a little over six years ago with the launch of um, this book I wrote. And, you know, at the time, going back to the archaeologists, like I had to dig hard to find five real big successes around the country. Now we've got hundreds of them being added every month. Um, and so it's really awesome to see that. And, you know, at the end of the day, we can be helpful uh, and all that, but I'm not fixing healthcare in Topeka or Tacoma or wherever, it's people rooted in those communities. So we really partner there. So that was way too long of an intro, but that's kind of no, my, no, my passion. I think it's important for people to understand like, you know, how, how one gets here. And, and quite honestly, you know, you're part of, if not leading this, this movement. And I always kind of think about movements um, you know, whatever it might be, it could be iconic history, you know, type of deals. You, you've got people that are, you know, in the front lines and then the people that are following either follow because it's in their heart and they're aligned with that mission, or there are other people that get pushed and kicked and yeah. directed there. And you and I, um, you know, I contacted you off of, of, a, a post that you made that I am one that's screaming from the, the mountaintops as well is like, you either need to get on this Mr. or Mrs. Employer, Mr. or Mrs. Advisor, or there's other things coming that are going to push. And I'd love that to be the subject of this conversation. When you think of, all right, you, you've started this movement, people are following because it's intrinsic in their nature, or some other reason, but now the people that are the, let's call them the laggers in this conversation are going to have some motivation. Let's dig into that. Where do you see that motivation and, and give people like the analogies that you had in your, in your post, because I thought it was just so brilliantly written. Yeah. I mean, part of that quest I was talking about earlier, just understand like what even regulates this space and why is this being allowed to happen was you know, ERISA, probably most of your audience heard of ERISA. And it's like, okay, what's this ERISA thing? And well, it has retirement benefits and health benefits. And it's like, wow, you know, as a company executive, I know, you know, that if I put my employees' um, retirement money into Uncle Bubba's investment fund that had high fees and terrible returns, I'd get my butt suit, right? I knew that. And I was like, wait a second, like if I put my employees' into Uncle Bubba's health plan that has high fees and terrible returns, like it doesn't seem to be enforced. And so that caused me to dig in what was different and what had happened. And what uh, the story is, there's, um, so, I mean, the, the ERISA has actually been around a long time, but really things got kicked off in the 2000s 
um, with the the Pension Modernization Act, and then uh, a class action firm led by a guy named Jerry Schlichter. And you know, fast forward, this is a hard and it was a new area of law, you know, from the court standpoint. But long story short, two unanimous Supreme Court verdicts, one 401k, one 403b, over $600 million of settlements just for this one law firm. And there's all these other kind of copycat. And so it's radically transformed uh, the retirement space. And it's like, okay, what's the trigger point? I mean, like the, you know, again, there was already the, the law in place, but there was this kind of trigger point. We have this trigger point now with the Consolidated Appropriations Act. If you look at um, what's in that, it really ties very closely with what happened in the retirement space, where if you look at the issue that went, that was the heart of the um, cases that had been settled and at the Supreme Court, it was around broker fees. And specifically in those cases, I think they were paying you know, retail rates when they should have been paying wholesale. That's kind of the summary of it. And um, I was like, oh, wow, like a founding principle of ours is, and the folks that we were studying that were doing such an amazing job, you know, they were transparent on their um, fees. And it was like, why shouldn't they be? Every high value professional I know of that gets paid a lot of money, whether it's a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, a doctor, well, maybe the doctor a little different with healthcare, but um, uh, management consultant, they charge a lot of money because they're worth it. But you know what you're paying, um, and we have some you know weird his history here, uh, and there's obviously different wrinkles. But I was like, wow, that's an interesting connection. And then, um, you know, I'd actually spoken with him when I wrote um, in my book. I wrote um, coming out of a meeting I'd been a part of, where there was a risk management practice leaders from some of the big four accounting firms, and one of them said the ERISA fiduciary risk around healthcare is the largest undisclosed risk they'd seen in their career. This is like seven years ago. Um, and I talked to Schlichter back then and uh, what's going on, understood and started listening to his podcast and all that. And then, you know, I was like, okay, well, he's he was very busy, you know, with his cases. Like, I wonder if you'll ever come into healthcare. Um, and then about a year ago, you started to see him reaching out to people in our community and more recently, in the last six months, you start to see ads where he's targeted, I think, 21 different companies so far. Um, and it's the early stage of a legal process um, where they are finding employees, because typically these are employees as a class suing their employers. And in parallel, what we've already seen with like the Kraft Heinz case and some others is employers are realizing they have to sue or be sued, particularly if you're a big player. And and so there's, you know, we'll see how that all unfolds. But if you look at what happened in the retirement space, there's billions and billions more in retirees' pockets because of all these cases. He not only will get settlements, but he always requires behavior change. And the DOL really kind of followed their lead. And so the even the way like if you look at um some of the big retirement brokerages um you know many of their people either left you know because kind of just the pure broker role uh went away many of them reinventing themselves as fiduciaries um and i mean went from like i think it was like um morgan stanley had like you know, it was like 12,000 and now they have a hundred, you know, fiduciaries or something like that. And I'm sure there's relationship people. I'm sure not all those people lost their jobs, but um, huge change, right? Really. And, and people that I respect a lot um, believe that when you combine the legislation with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the transparency and coverage and transparency and pricing executive order, even though they're separate, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And then you look at these cases that are being built. There's another law firm called Fairmark that just has put out ads to target Lockheed Martin, Martin employees. Biggest change in employee health benefits since 1943 is the consensus. Like that's a BFT as one former, you know, VP once said. So 
So it's funny when you said, you know, hey, about the high value uh, folks and their payment. My my old chairman used to say a quote that stuck with me forever. It says, price is only an issue absent of value, right? Yeah. If anybody would pay for value if you're getting it, uh, and, and that's the problem, obviously, in our space. It's, you know, hey, all these fees are being paid. All of these costs are going up. All these executives are making tons and tons of money, bonuses and bonuses. But meanwhile, the average person down in, you know, you know, let's use Bubba as our example. Bubba, you know, carrying the lunch pail, going to work all day long is filing bankruptcy and, and all those things. Yeah. For the average person who has not heard of the CAA, um, can you describe it in the layman's term as to, you know, what it says? Yeah. I mean, the two biggest parts of it that are relevant to us, one is we talked about uh, broker, um, we're really compensation disclosure, really anybody playing a consultative role. And so that's, that's an area, many would argue that there's some TPAs that are essentially playing a de facto advisory role, but we'll see. But for sure, it's broker advisors, direct and indirect revenue. And we found up to 17, when we started diving into plans, we found up to 17 undisclosed revenue streams. So that all needs to be disclosed. Um, so that's a huge thing, certainly ties to that past legislation. The other really huge thing is that, and there's, we're right now in this time where companies have to attest that they don't have gag clauses in their um, agreements, which are really the norm in a lot of these agreements with big carriers. And it's, it, again, it's just kind of bizarre, right? Like I've been in business a long time. I've never seen a business that is proud of its value and its work not bury you in data. And so it that's shouldn't be a pretty obvious red flag that, you know, when they put up the smoke and mirrors like, oh, it's proprietary data, blah, blah, blah. Like bottom line, we've never not gotten the data because we know how to ask and what laws to reference and and do it in a professional, straight up way. Um, but a lot of people just kind of give up when they say, oh, no, no, you can't get access to that. Um, and so those are really the heart and soul. Because of course, you know, I think it was Michael Bloomberg said, you can't manage what you can't measure. Well, you can't measure anything if you don't have visibility into it. Um, and so that's really the heart and soul of it is. And it does have, it. that's a, a duty that the employer has. Now, some people are doing on their behalf to attest that they don't have that. And so again, there's there's going to be some legal tussles to see how that all shakes, shakes out. But the the language is clear on it. We'll see how the court's interpreted and who's the fiduciary. And, you know, when there's these kind of Russian nested doll, you know, agreements, you know, that are out there, um, we'll see how that plays out. But it's, yeah, it's a, definitely a big deal. And and Dave, you know, I spent the first 15 years of my career uh, as an advisor at a big firm, you know, one of the top three global firms. And, you know, back then I would have a discussion with, with, with prospective clients and current clients says, you know, clout, right? Leverage. We've got this leverage and, and blah, blah, blah. But reality of it is we still ran into the same shit that we're dealing with, with like, you know, I can't get the information. And, um, I asked for this report. They purposefully left NPI numbers off because I can't do the right analysis if I don't have all the right information, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You more probably represent a, a wider array. It's not just obviously big brokers, but it is your your local Topeka, Kansas, you know, type of guy and gal that's that's truly driving. This conversation that we are having is not a big broker, little broker, you know, this this is everybody's top to bottom, left to right, not only from the compliance piece of it, but arming people and, and having the knowledge and the wherewithal and quite honestly, the heart and the desire, because a little of this back to the movement piece of it needs to be, you need to get up and do what you think is the right thing to do every day. And yeah. monetary and workload is over here and driving value is over here. And sometimes those things don't go, but this isn't a small versus big. This is everybody across the spectrum would you would you agree to that yeah absolutely and and actually when the there was hearings for the consolidated appropriations act and it's kind of prior 
Um, it was originally that component was called the Lower Healthcare Cost Act. Um, when there was some, it, you know, question around, oh, this would be too burdensome to to disclose fees. Um, you know, they referenced us as like, hey, they've got 250 folks over there. Many of them are very small um, shops. Many of the employers are small or medium size. They don't seem to have a problem. What's the issue? I mean, at the end of the day, there's somebody is cutting a check, right, to the broker in their office. Those are zeros and ones in some computer somewhere. It's just whether you want to share those or not. Um, and so, yeah, that's it's it's cuts across the board, and and you know, like you, there's a lot of folks who got frustrated in some larger firms and wanted to do the right thing. Um, and we're not asking anybody to take a vow of poverty. I mean, the people who are doing some of the most amazing work are like their big problem is fast growth. Like that that is a problem. That's a gold plated problem, but that is a problem. Don't get me wrong. Like that is a challenge. And we've seen some organizations on the solution side get crushed by growth, you know, so you have to be careful of that. But the point is you can make a great living and the best advisors, frankly, are underpaid given the value that they derive, you know, drive to their clients. And that, that's such an interesting conversation. I, I have it a lot with employers. It's like, you know, their attorneys, their accountants are sitting at the, the big boy table. But when you think of a human capital total rewards conversation, there isn't somebody that's touching more economic value for that organization than, you know, people in, in our space. And, you know, it's interesting. It took, it took my mom getting sick with pancreatic cancer for me to make that jump because I was fat and happy. I was thinking I was doing all of the right things. So yeah. you kind of you never know until you know. And I and I often quote the the Spider Man quote, right? With with great uh, power comes great responsibility. In our world, that power is the knowledge that there are other ways than just going to Blue Cross United Signet and Humana to grab a, a health plan. And you know, it, it's such an interesting you know, fight as an organization. So when you're, when you're having this conversation and, you know, we're talking about disclosures, we're talking about this with intuitively, I think everybody that hears the message that you talk about says that that guy knows what he's talking about. It makes, it makes sense. But when it comes down to it, you can combine all of the people that are in Health Rosetta and all the other organizations that are like a peer organization. And we all have 2% of the market, right? Right. Kind. So when when you think about that now, 2% is better than a point, you know, yeah. a small percentage. Or, you know, there is movement. But when you think about that and you, the audience on this is advisors and employers, why? Why is it that what's coming out of your mouth absolutely makes sense? You could point to other, back to your archaeologist, other historical facts that says it's coming. We've got proof. We know how to do it. Here's the pathway, the playbook. Why are we sitting here with a combination of 2% of the market? 98% of the other percent of the other people would rather take the easy way out. Why? Yeah. I mean, any time there's a big industry shift, you have the natural adoption curve. And I think here it's it's no different. And the 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 but where it gets a little different is in any category where you have status quo incumbent players, one of the tactics they use is what in tech we call fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? To sort of freeze the status quo. And nothing is easier to use fear, uncertainty, and doubt on than healthcare, right? I mean, how many times have you heard, you know, this might be disruptive? And I'm like, you know, and sometimes I'll push back. People will call me a disruptor. I'm like, no, I'm not a disruptor. I'm a restorer of, of sanity, right? What's disruptive is stealing 30 years of wage gains. What's disruptive is preventable medical mistakes being the third leading cause of death. What's disruptive is employer-based plans have funded and fueled the first 20 years of the opioid crisis, like dot, 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 right? I read a chapter. We've gone to war for less than what healthcare has done to America. Like that's disruptive. Um, but nonetheless, you know, old habits die hard and the, the 
the reality is for bigger companies at least um they they won't act until there's a legal target on their back there is now for smaller companies um if you're told you know this is the best we can do and you trust these people and you know we're just going to make it suck less for you and for a while you know this quote unquote solution was to just shove the financial burden on the back of the people who could least afford it. And, you know, people have seen that hasn't played out and it's had a lot of negative consequences even beyond the financial piece. Um, and so I think those are just the natural factors. But um, the other thing is is that we have a lot of amazing people in our collective movement, like you said, across the different organizations. The thing that I would probably critique on, um, on s- some of the past strategies versus what we're attempting to do. And when you look at social movements, revolutions, is um, we all know word of mouth is the most powerful form of marketing and there is. Well, where does word of mouth work best? It works locally, yeah. right? Where, um, and to give you an example, right? One of the folks in our movement um, is a guy named Bryce Heinbaugh. And Bryce, five years ago, he was the status quo. He's making good money, but it didn't feel good. And he heard about us. And then he started down that journey. And you look at the early years, it's sort of laughably small. And like, why does this care? But that's one of the things having come out of tech is exponential growth always looks very unimpressive in the early years. Yeah. And whereas Bryce went from, you know, one employer, 38 lives to the next year, it was like several, maybe... 530 lives. The next year, uh, it was, I think, about 1,600 lives. The next year, 3,700 lives. He's about 10,000. This isn't one one guy's book of business. He he has that. And, and what's happened there is it's in a particular county. And it's sort of like, you know, if you lived in, say, Kansas City, and you're a VP of benefits, HR, CFO, whatever, you might have heard of Kaiser, but it's like not a thing, right? But then maybe you get moved to Denver or Northern California. You just know like that's a thing there. And now our thing is kind of like that in that area. It's a thing. And one of the things that you know we studied a lot was um, the U.S. Green Building Council LEED standards. We That's probably the analogy that we use the most because the built environment's an awful lot like healthcare. It's really local. And it's really entrenched. And there wasn't like some magic day where all the old polluting buildings got raised and the next day they're all magic and green built. But there were particular locales, places like Seattle and Denver and Boulder and Austin, that there was this concentration activity and then it just exploded. Um, and so when you, the problem that like even some of the best, most prominent people who've done amazing work, they'll come in, drive incredible results, then some new VP comes in and like, what the hell is this crazy stuff over here? You guys are, you know, you're from crazy town, um, you know, and maybe they got some relationship with somebody and they can just shut it down, even though that advisor's done amazing work for them. I don't think that happens when you're in a place like Ashtabula, Ohio, because it's like, oh, everybody's doing this. It's, it's safe to jump in the water. It's just kind of the new normal here. And the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that was working before just doesn't work when people can see with their own eyes. Um, and so that's a big, big part of it. Yeah. It's funny you say that I I lost my very, very first client in this movement, this last six, one, they were 38% below cost of when I picked them up five years ago, they switched to a big name shop, the largest insurance consulting firm in the world. I never got to see what numbers they showed them, but all of a sudden I get a letter that says you're fired. And I'm just thinking, wow, there was no disrupt. I mean, like just textbook and to your point, it's like, man, but in that scenario, it's Atlanta, right? There's bits and pieces of cool things happening, but it's not like, you know, it's a, it's a big enough market where there's enough volume in there. Yeah. You're, you're seeing positive things you seeing positive people, the number of people that are joining movement is increasing. The CAA is producing some, some tailwinds in this movement. Yeah. 
you have your crystal ball in front of you. What does Dame Chase say the next three, five, seven, ten years is going to look like? And then I'm going to ask you pieces of advice based yeah. on that. But what do you see is coming down the pike in in your magic eight ball? If people are old enough for to uh, to remember those things, or let's just say the crystal ball for the young ones. Yeah, yeah, uh, I remember those magic eight balls. I uh, I, I had several of them. <laughs> yeah, um, I think what you're going to see is. Um, an ex acceleration on a, a number of fronts. Um, and one of the things we haven't talked about that's going to be one of the accelerants is a generational shift that's happening at the same time there's this additional um, kind of legislative regulatory. You have the the oldest millennials now are in their 40s, not exactly young, right? And I don't think there's anybody that think the current system is remotely designed for what millennials or Gen Z want. And they're now increasingly, they're 75% of the workforce in a few years of priority, two thirds of the workforce today. So it's not like, oh, they're a future thing, right? Like it's here already. And increasingly they're in decision-making authority. And kind of like you, if you weren't unfortunate to have had your own you know, childhood disease or something, you don't pay that much attention to the healthcare system until either you have kids or you have an, a parent and then you're like, what the hell? Like I've been spending the equivalent of buying a, you know, my first car every year and I don't even hardly touch this. Right. People are going to start questioning it and the thing is they want. So that's, that's the other backdrop. But, um, so I think you're going to see, and we, we do see, fortunately, you know, the, there's this quote from science fiction, the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. So we already see pockets. Like I mentioned one, and we have about a dozen of those in different stages of development and people will start to see, oh my gosh, right? That happened in, in this place in Ohio and here's one in, in Maryland and here's one in Pennsylvania and here's one in Texas and Colorado, da, da, da. Um, and the, you know, oh, that's just kind of an exception just goes away and it starts to accelerate. Meantime, there's going to be some of this legislative, you know, regulatory and, you know, Frankly, when the regulators don't regulate, the litigators litigate. And that's what's happening, you know, starting to happen. And so I think five years, realistically, is probably the amount of time it will take for that to really play out. It's not a fast process. Um, certainly people are aware there's lots of shots across the bow right now, um, but it will take a while for that. Meanwhile, in that three-year time frame, I think there'll be of those, you know, dozen that we're directly involved in, um, they will be more like the one I mentioned with Bryce, where it's just, you know, it's reaching five digits. Like that's not a small number. Right. Um, and and so I think that's I think will really happen in that time frame. Um, and and then what the other thing that, you know, may sound well, I'll call it enlightened self interest. I don't want to be too self serving here, where um, we are providing information and tools to make it a lot easier to do these things because these plans have been totally worth it, but too much work for them to get replicated. Um, and so that's a big part. Like if you look at that situation in Ohio, they're all operating independently. They're not even on a captive, but they're all on the same chassis, right? They've got the same primary care, the same stop loss, the same contracts or care, you know, same PBM, da, da, da. Um, and so there's tremendous efficiency um, there. And so the one of the things that we're doing is, let's say, you know, you, you went back to the market share, like we achieve our wildest, crazy success imaginable over the next five or 10 years. Um, it's still not going to be 20, 50% of the market, us alone. Right. But if you look at how deeply entrenched powerful forces have been transformed in technology and automotive and things like that, um, open sourcing was a big part of that. And so one of the things that we're doing is if you unpack, like, why is it that the worst result that we've had when we get directly engaged with an employer or union is a 20% absolute reduction in spending? Um, it's because I don't know anybody who sweats the details of contracts more than us. 
And we, we're approaching for a very small organization, we're approaching seven figures of investment on the legal side to level playing field. We could keep that to ourselves, but we would not change the industry and, our, and we wouldn't have as much success anyway if we're still the outlier. So we have started open sourcing essentially our know-how. So we kind of do this concentric circle thing or ripples in the pond where we battle tested ourselves one-on-one -on -one with employers, rewrite these contracts, get them fair for both sides. And then we then make it available to all the folks in the health Rosetta community. And so, you know, they collectively steward about 5 million lives. If you add Health Transformation Alliance, because Lee Lewis is part of a group, that's another set or eight million. So that's a nice group right, to, to reach out. But now what we did, um, you know, my little virtual background is this Rosetta Fest, our annual gathering. We did our first drop. So if you go to health, had our, go to our website, we did it at Rosetta Fest. You go to healthrosetta.org slash open source, the TPA agreements, checklists, best practices, um, all that is, it's really cool what's happened. People are starting to use that I just heard, we did a webinar about a week ago and it was a huge union, 300,000 members. And she's like, those resources were so incredibly helpful. We are going through our RFP and we took all your model contract language along with all these checklist things to go into RFP. But they literally, if you want to respond to the RFP, you redline that their contract. Like, how about that? Wow. You don't want to play there? Or you make the whole thing red, that is what it is. It's a free country. You don't have to participate in that. Um, so those types of things you don't anticipate when you open source, but they happen. And that's part of the power of that. And that's, you know, how, you know, deeply powerful force get in trenches. We put that out there. And we've probably open sourced about 10% of what we're going to open source. Because it's one thing for us to use it. But to make it usable for others, there's some work to be done. And so we have to go through that. We actually got some um, grant money to do that. And we will just continue to roll that out when when people go, you know, to that, you know, healthrosetta.org slash open source, they fill out their information, they can download the information, and then that we notify them when there's updates and there's new things, and we'll continue to do that. And so we think that is um deeply valuable and disruptive and whether or not you ever get associated with health rosetta or come to any of our events have at it right it's it's that important to our country to to do that and i you know i don't know how that will all unfold but i know when those types of things happen it's it's very catalytic for big change big change awesome awesome so you you, you got your crystal ball you stated that so in order to ensure we surpass your wildest dreams. I want you to retire the happiest man on earth. What would the advice you give, and I'm going to break these apart, to the advisor community? In order for Dave to, to, to see and be witness of the industry changing to the point where you're writing your last chapter and you're like, damn, I was a part of something that I can go on to the next chapter, you know, being what, what would, what advice would you tell that advisor that you need them to start thinking about doing today in order for that to happen in five, 10, you're still a young man. So I'm going to give you five to yeah. 10 more years before you, yeah. you hang up, uh, hang up the, the turtleneck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what I would say is two things. One is this is my life works, my calling. So it'll be like, Grr! and then it'll be at that point when, when I, uh, I, you know, slip on a, um, uh, banana peel and end up in a coffin. Um, but, uh, cause it's, it's too much fun to quit. Um, but the advice I would give is, uh, the advice I give to a lot of young people, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. And you don't have to figure it all out um, day one. Just start on that journey. And that's one of the things like you can start with very small steps and they compound and they grow exponentially. And so pick your spot, right? It could be a single client, single prospect, a single area. It can seem trivial. And that's one of the things like 
in my younger days, I used to think, and, and partly like at Microsoft, like, oh, we got to you know, change the world and, you know, these big numbers and, you know, we didn't pick anything or choose, pursue anything that wasn't a billion dollar business. I've kind of been disabused of that, right? Like some of the most compelling stuff, it starts very, very small. You know, I mentioned the example earlier and don't be ashamed of that, embrace it. And, and, um, this is a long journey, right? And you will get to develop your craft and, um, you know, kind of the corollary that I'll share with people, you know, young in their careers, like, you know, generally as an adult, it's better to have a job than not have a job. But once you develop some skill, it's much better to have a career than a job. And that's great, but far better than a career is a calling where, you know, it's like the old Mark Twain, you know, the two most important days in your life or the day you're born, the day you figure out why, like you're on fire, right? And it's the old cliche, you know, if you love what you're doing, you're not working a day in your life. And that's the thing is, um, don't get me wrong. We get our asses kicked every day and our teeth kicked in all the time. But at the same time, in fact, I just posted this morning um, a letter from a member, right? We're changing lives. It's not some trite thing, like literally changing lives of people at a one-by-one -one basis. And that provides that fuel while you continue to, you know, we got to take a lot of punches. You know, I had an uncle who was a new products guy and he retires like, you're a new products guy? Yeah, I learned how to take a lot of punches. Um, and that's okay. You don't mind taking them if you're doing something meaningful. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So let's switch that to the opposite side of, of the table, if you will, that employer, right? That employer has been as a, the industry. And I always say like you, like I was part of the issue too. I worked at the big ivory tower consulting firm. I was touting network discount analysis and I was you know, putting more people in a non-transparent PBM model because that's that's what you knew of then. But you've got these employers that for decades have been being told there's nothing you could do. A claim is a claim. All those stupid cliches that now drive me crazy of the advisor that I was yeah. versus what I am now. What do you tell a room full of employers, VPs of HR, benefits, CEOs, CFOs? What, what do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, it, it's they all know that they are in a, you know, everybody says, you know, employees are our most valuable asset. We're in a talent war. Um, and, you know, if you look at why do people, um, you know, why do companies provide health benefits? It's not really, there's really no regulatory teeth on that. It's to attract and retain employees. And, you know, as you said, a lot of them think, because they're spending a lot of money and they've been told something, it's as good as it gets. But once you realize that something can be like 10x better at half the cost, I mean, first of all, you probably don't believe it. Um, but once you dig in and you go visit and talk to these people, it's not 10% better, like it's dramatically better. And, and you know, and you can look at it from a, you know, like, we mentioned Rosen Hotels, like they've got six times better retention um, than their competition. You can tell when you go there, people enjoy working there. And for most businesses, the productivity of their employees is the bottom line. And healthcare costs is also the second biggest cost. Um, and so when you can take something that is viewed as, as just this kind of giant headache, and turn it into a source of competitive advantage. Um, you know, one of the um, things we did was we created a simple calculator. You go to healthrosetta.org slash CFO. You put the CFO, here's what the EBITDA impact and your enterprise value. And, you know, one of the amazing success stories that we have is a manufacturer. You know, they're it's about 700 people. 40 locations. Six years ago, they were spending over $8 million on their health plan. They were projected to be spending over $11 million by today. The last three years, after they improved benefits, like removing cost sharing, things like that, um, under $3.5 million. Wow. 
think about that. You're a low margin, slow growth company. I talked to the CFO, wrote about this. Um, to have the same bottom line profit impact, they would have to increase top line sales 25 to 30%. How hard is that if you're a mature, you know, call it $200 million a year revenue company? Like that's dang near impossible. Right. And and so that's a type of thing where rather than this being this giant headache every year, like to see it as a competitive advantage in recruiting retention and performance your workforce. Certainly you have a, a healthier workforce, they're going to be more productive. And then for free, you get this huge financial benefit. I, that's a triple threat, right? There. Yahtzee. Yeah, Yahtzee. Well, Dave, you and I could probably talk about this for, for hours on end. If somebody heard this and like, man, I, I got to hear more, read more, see more. Uh, where does somebody learn more about Dave Chase and, and Health Rosetta? Where, where can they keep up with you? Yeah, I mean, certainly our website. And, you know, the but the boots on the ground is really where I direct people. You go to healthrosetta.org slash map. You can find people in your area and, you know, start with them, get to know them, right? Most of the folks are great to me. They're happy to educate and, you know, start to to look at it. And one of the things that um, really is, has been one of our um, central kind of apex capability is something we call the plan grader. And basically, one of the things that we reflect on early on was, you know, I can pick up any random thing off my desk, you know, as pencil, and I bet there's a thousand reviews on Amazon, and yet 20% of our economy, there's not an objective mark of value. Wasn't easy to come up with that, but that's what these advisors can do is, is you know, think of it, you use a medical metaphor. It's kind of you get a diagnostic score and you kind of get a prescription or care plan on how to fix it. And you can decide what to do. And of course, a great advisor um, you know, there might be a punch list of 50 things. You're not going to do all of them, but say, hey, let's do these three. Um, and so that's a, a great way to just sort of understand where you're at. And, you know, we're not about throwing people under the bus, but we're like, we're tough graders, right? Why shouldn't we be given the lives on the line, the financial line? Most of the status quo plans that we've scored get between a seven and 20 out of a hundred. Um, you don't have to be health plan wonk to understand you can do better than 20 out of 100. Um, and we show people like, this isn't a pipe dream. People are doing it all over, just like you. Um, and so that's a great way for people to engage. And, and you know, or you come to our event, right? You, Rosetta Fest, which is my backdrop here. We get together once a year. There'll be one in September. First time we're going to DC. You know, we open it up to the broader community for the first time this year. Um, and so, you know, welcome people to come out and they can see if it's for real or not, you know, and be their own judge. Well, Dave, thanks so much for all the time, energy, leadership, passion. Uh, they say, you know, the first person through the door normally gets the first bullet. So <laughs> thank you on behalf of the rest of the people that admire you like I do. Uh, thanks for taking those first bullets for all of us. So we appreciate yeah. it. Well, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on and thanks for doing all you're doing. And you're a, a strong voice out there and I know you influence a ton of people. So I really appreciate that. Awesome, Dave. Thanks so much, bud. You bet. Take care. You've been listening to Impact Healthcare, people and strategies that are disrupting the health benefits industry with Lester Morales. Remember, the journey to getting 20% savings on your health care benefits starts with total transparency. Remember to subscribe to the Impact Healthcare podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts.